So those of you who are part of the GBCB, Genetics, Bioinformatics, and Computational Biology program may recognize Dr. Seelfon, who was here on campus, I guess, within the last couple of years, giving a presentation as part of that seminar series, and we're delighted uh, to have him back as part of the summer school and symposium. Uh, he's at the Mount Sinai Hospital and School of Medicine, where he serves as Glickenhaus Professor and chairman of the Department of Neurology. Uh, and he's also director of the Center for Genomics, Proteomics, and Bioinformatics, director for the Center for Translational Systems Biology, and he's a professor of pharmacology and systems therapeutics. Uh, and he, uh, as Joseph mentioned, he directs the multi-institutional program for research on immune modeling and experimentation, or PRIME, which is one of these NIH-funded modeling immunity for biodefense centers. Uh, he got his BS from Princeton University, and as with all of these introductions, I've gleaned things from the internet. I didn't see exactly what he majored in at Princeton, but he did say that he received a thesis award in comparative literature. Um, and then he got his MD uh, from Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons, completed internships and residency in neurology at Massachusetts General Hospital, fellowship in neuroscience at Mount Sinai. Medical Center, and he's been an assistant professor at Mount Sinai since 1988, having risen through the ranks to his pre present positions. Um, he's made important contributions to research in a number of areas, the receptor structure, cell signaling, mechanisms of drug specificity, systems biology, uh, really integrating experimental and computational <coughs> theoretical kinds of approaches. Uh, and so today, the title of this talk is Information Coding of dendritic cell responses to virus infection. Pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much for that kind of introduction, and uh, thank you all for the <coughs> waiting through the technical delay. Um, and thanks to the organizers for, and Joseph for inviting me to talk today. So Prime is involved in uh, uh, developing various useful tools for analyzing immunological data sets and mining public data sets, and I'm not going to present any of that work today. It's available on our, on our website, and all of our data and our models are, are accessible uh, through there as well. And I'm going to focus on um, uh, a few selected aspects of our work on understanding the interaction of, of viruses with the human uh, dendritic cells. The immune response to influenza infection is emergent from a confluence of, of various virus and host factors. Um, included among these are the interaction of the virus with various host cell types. Uh, within cell type, variation of the response that may influence the early response to infection and the cellular responses. The effect of the cytokine microenvironment that uh, in, in the first talk, uh, the complex nature of that was presented uh, uh, in, in all of its glorious complexity. And it is extremely complex. And the coding of the cytokine microenvironment is extremely complicated. We've done work on that. We're not going to discuss that today. And then the effect of the virus, which has evolved various strategies using its uh, remarkably compact genome to interact with uh, very specific aspects uh, of the host immune response. So we're going to focus on two aspects. One is the question of what's the difference between genetically um, uh, related uh, influenza strains. Uh, and we're going to focus on the H1N1 um, uh, <coughs> subtypes of influenza. Um, and uh, we're going to uh, be discussing the work on single dendritic cell response variation, what the mechanisms are underlying that. The dendritic cell is a professional antigen-presenting cell. It's the key mediator of the innate adaptive immune transition. It coordinates to a significant extent the initial immune response and the development of subsequent humoral and adaptive long-term immunity. <clears throat> and in most of this work um, uh, that we've done in PRIME, uh, we've worked on the model of human monocyte-derived dendritic cells. Uh, we, we also more recently have started working with uh, primary blood and primary lung dendritic cells um, as well. 
Now, the H1N1 influenza virus uh, first came around in 1918 and killed 2% of the world's population. And the specter of that and the limitation of current therapeutics and vaccine technology uh, continues a very high level of interest, uh, especially with a second recurrence of a much, much less uh, lethal uh, epidemic, but with very, very high penetrance in, in 2009, the swine H1N1 influenza virus, which infected more than 10% of the world's population in some countries, that's been estimated and infected approximately 50% of people. And so the, the risk of a pandemic that is <coughs> affects a large percent of the world's population but has a much higher level of toxicity is, is obviously a, a continuing concern and what motivates improvements in the attempt to understand the pathogenesis of these viruses and how the um, uh, short-term and long-term immune response is generated, how toxicity develops in, in individuals um, and how that could be intervened with both in terms of uh, uh, rational therapeutic targeting and improved vaccine technology. Um, and the current treatments and the vaccination approaches are only partially effective. Uh, uh, many people, especially the elderly and young, don't give a vaccine response, and even among everyone else, it's <clears throat> nowhere near universal. And the carryover of the vaccine from year to year is, is relatively low with the recurrence of, of strains each year, which is why the, the 2009 pandemic um, and, uh, as a variation, had a very significant uh, infection rate in the population. <clears throat> and the virus um, has uh, developed strategies in order to uh, suppress the immune response. And the best studied component of this is the non-structural protein 1, which uh, each of the H1N1s has <coughs> modified somewhat. Um, and in various viruses, it has a, a number of uh, different attributes. It can suppress interferon induction. Uh, it can uh, suppress uh, via interaction with the protein CPSF30, um, pre-mRNA processing in the cell and, and export. Um, and, and it has a number of other attributes that are described that suppress the cellular host immune response and promotes uh, viral replication. <clears throat> um, and, and as we'll see in this, there are, there are many things going on in what the virus does to interact with the host besides NS1, but NS1 is usually the first place to start. And so shown here is a way this is um, constructs uh, uh, obtained from our collaborator, um, Garcia <coughs> um, Sastre Adolfo, Garcia Sastre, where uh, PR8 virus has a, a deletion of the NS1 uh, gene, and we see uh, if we if we infect dendritic cells with uh, a non-pathogenic virus, this is a chicken virus, Newcastle disease virus, and so there's no suppression. It gives you, it, it's a nice model because it gives you a full-blown, unopposed response for which the virus has no mechanisms for interfering with it. And you see, you get a very high level of interference, interference secretion, which is a critical key initial viral innate response mechanism. The flu, PR8 virus, nearly entirely suppresses the interference secretion. If you use the deleted virus, you again get an enormous interference secretion. So you can see how enormously effective the virus is um, in just this one aspect in, in modifying the host response. <clears throat> so we start with the differences between influenza strains. And we're predominantly looking at uh, four viruses. Um, two seasonal viruses. We, we do most work with Newcastle 99 and Texas 91, which are similar seasonal viruses. They do have some differences between them and how they behave. And then we look at these two pandemics, uh, the Brevik 1918, which is studied in a high pathogen environment, and, and we, the Cal-09. Uh, we generate uh, data sets uh, for analysis uh, using uh, typically microarray, Luminex, uh, real-time PCR, analyze it with uh, various tools and modeling approaches, generate hypotheses, proceed with follow-up studies, and, and continue in this iterative cycle to try to gain insight into the host mechanisms, viral mechanisms, and how they fit together. <clears throat> so 
um, the initial data set we started with is, is a uh, very detailed microarray time course study done in the dendritic cells um, uh, over uh, time, time course infection for the four viruses um, done uh, comparatively in two different hosts, uh, two cells from, from two different known donors. Um, and when we analyze the results, we see that um, there's a core gene response that occurs in common, which is uh, largely dominated by the interferon response and the downstream response to interferon. Um, and, and then among the two uh, seasonal viruses and among the two pandemic viruses, you have the highest commonality in just the overall gene response. Um, if we look at um, the uh, NS1 uh, RNA production, the viral, viral transcript uh, assay by PCR, you see the dramatic difference, for example, between the CALO9, which is much slower in generating NS1 and generates a lower level, for example, than New Caledonia 99. So the uh, dynamics of these viruses are, are extremely different in, in a reproducible fashion. So one difference between the NS1 that was identified between the uh, California 09 and, and the, the seasonal viruses, the Texas and the New Caledonia, um, uh, is, is that the Cal09 has three mutations in its NS1, or three changes in its NS1, that lead to an inability to inject with CPSF30. So it loses this suppression of X score. So, so we know the NS1 proteins are different. <coughs> and so we examined that initially in a, in a differential equation mathematical model, taking the microarray data for selected genes to um, and, and uh, generate um, hypotheses that we could subsequently examine. Um, and, and the purpose of modeling here is, is to test the plausibility of hypotheses, how well can they fit the data, um, insist, in, insist in interpreting these, these complex data sets, and, and they have a significant benefit in telling you what you really know, what you don't know, and in guiding the experimentation. <laughs> um, you know, we use uh, an eclectic uh, uh, approach to modeling. Um, this is an ODE model, which is directed for this, this specific purpose. And so we're interested in, in extracting the dynamic features of the viral antagonism. Our working hypothesis is, can you explain the pattern differences that we see in the microarray from differences in the viral antagonism mechanism? And so we're focusing on the NC99 and the CAL09, incorporate the effective viral antagonism, incorporate the differences in the mechanism, and see uh, what hypotheses come out of that. This, this is a schematic showing the major components of the model. The virus enters, it's sensed, it causes uh, production of interferon. Uh, interferon then will activate um, the type 1 interferon receptor, lead to activation of STAD and, and interferon responsive genes. Um, NS1 will uh, interfere with the, the sensing and production of interferon for both the New Caledonia and the California virus. And in the New Caledonia virus, because it interacts with CPS of 30, it'll interfere with the export of the mature RNAs for all of the RNAs that are generated. <coughs> and this is uh, just the equations for the model, and we're representing the NS1 inhibition by two components, IC1 and IC2, to represent those, those two properties, the interferon inhibition and the export inhibition. So if we fit the, uh, uh, parameterize the model to fit the data, um, the data is, is shown in, in these squares with, with boxes um, for um, interferon, beta, interferon alpha, TNF, STAT, IRF7. Um, and we get a reasonable approximation um, uh, with the only difference in the models uh, being the IC1 and IC2 features uh, for, for the experimental data. <coughs> so, so um, uh, in the California, we have um, uh, uh, IC1 um, evolution over time, and, and there's no effect on nuclear export. And in, for the New Caledonia 99, the, the strength of the inhibition is, is much higher, um, and we have an uh, uh, inhibition of export 
that, that is present as well. So, so at least uh, the model tells us that the time course of response, for example, the interferon differences, the interferon beta mRNA induction, um, uh, can be reasonably explained within the error variation of the data by um, NS1 differences between the viruses, and we know there are mechanistic differences. So, um, of course, the model is just for hypothesis generation, and so then we proceed to test it. And for that, well, you know, we're interested in the predominantly the interferon beta induction pattern um, and, and whether um, it's influenced. And so we use, um, uh, Adolfo's group uses reverse genetics and Randy Albrecht, who generated these constructs, to move the uh, NS1 from the New Caledonia into the Cal09 to see whether the pattern will change. Uh, we also moved the Texas as well, uh, which has similar features in this respect and also contains the CPS 30 as an additional control. <coughs> now, you know, this is a kind of complex response system, so, so you know, the interferon is only going to be generated within cells that are infected. We're infecting at an MOI of one, and so about approximately two-thirds of the cells are infected by virus, and interferon induction requires direct rig I, PAMP, response within the cell. So interferon beta will only induce interferon uh, within infected cells. On the other hand, the interferon response genes can potentially <coughs> be generated in the third of cells that are not infected, and also can be generated in the infected cells as well from the secreted interferon then acting back on the cell. All of this within the infected cells can be opposed by the viral antagonist. So inter interpreting the data, you have to keep these these various complexities in mind. So if we look at MX, we get, um, uh, which is an interferon response gene, it will be induced in both uh, infected and non-infected cells by the effect of interferon. Uh, it will be suppressed to a degree in infected cells, especially in the New Caledonia by blocking nuclear export. Um, and, and we get an um, intermediate effect of, the, of moving the NS1. In other words, the, the uh, uh, California gives a very high MX1 uh, uh, response. Um, the uh, uh, constructs containing the Texas or the New Caledonia NS1 protein on the California background give an intermediate response. And the New Caledonia uh, gives, gives a lower response. So it's a, it's a slight effect, but it's, it's uh, intermediate, as might be expected, because um, uh, we may be looking at effects uh, in a mixture of infected and non-infected cells, but the test is the interferon response, and, and there, contrary to the fact that we can fit the data very nicely with the model, when we test this in the rigor of the experimental crucible, um, the hypothesis is wrong. So, so um, you know, I, I think it's kind of a nice example of modeling helps guide your initial thinking, but it's 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 you know it's it's a useful endeavor. Uh, but the hypotheses, even though they look very good, often don't hold up experimentally. So I thought in a in a modeling symposium, this was a, a good example to present because in fact it's it's a very useful result. We go and test the experiment. We get a very early high response with interferon beta, a low and slower response with the California infection, and the NS1 containing uh, 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 Texas NS1 and New Caledonia NS1 containing on the California background look exactly like the California virus. So, so NS1 is now out. <coughs> so, <coughs> we go back to the MATLAB and the Blackboard, and we focus on <coughs> the fact that, okay, this uh, uh, isn't the primary early response, especially the interferon response, is simply not being driven by NS1 differences. Um, <coughs> so what might be involved? Well, one of the striking features is really that the, the interferon response with the New Caledonia, it's, it's very large and it's very, very early. In fact, it's so early, it's hard to imagine you know, getting virus synthesis to generate the response, whereas the Cal is later. So we wondered whether the response um, 
uh, in fact requires viral synthesis. And so he uses that when, when the um, viral um, uh, uh, RNA uh, is, is recognized as leading to an activation of IRF3 as one of the steps in nuclear translocation in uh, uh, generating interferon beta. And so we looked at the effect of uh, virus uh, infection on, on IRF translocation. And we're interested in looking at what happens if we suppress the ability of uh, uh, the virus to generate um, any RNA and protein by inhibiting protein synthesis with cyclohexamide, uh, <coughs> leptomycin, uh, uh, mRNA translation, and actinomycin uh, transcription of RNA. So we find is that in the new Caledonia at one hour, we get a very robust activation of um, uh, IRF3, um, and there's no effect of blocking actinomycin, uh, cyclohexamide, LMB, and, and all three together. So, so it appears that one of the major differences between the California and the New Caledonia is that the <coughs> dendritic cells are recognizing the uh, viral infection before the virus even initiates any synthetic processes. So how, how could that be and why might it be different between the viruses? Well, <coughs> presumably the virus must be recognizing the RNPs that come in, uncode, and initiate and there must be some difference between the Cal RNPs and the uh, New Caledonia RNPs that enable one to be detected and the other not to be detected. Well, the RNPs are made up of the viral sequence and complexed with the polymerase complex, which is made up of three subunits. So we decided, okay, let's change the structure of the RNP and see if that has any effect on the pattern of the response. And so to do that, we <coughs> switch the polymerases from New Caledonia into the California background. And now when we look at the response, <coughs> here's California, interferon beta production, here's New Caledonia, and the swap is now looking like New Caledonia. So at least so far, this is more consistent with, in fact, this, the RNP as an activator is very, very different. And in fact, it's different because of the structure of the polymerases themselves complexed with the, <coughs> with the uh, uh, viral gene. Okay, so, you know, we, uh, we could speculate about why this is, but, you know, really these viruses have evolved very, very different strategies. You know, so, so the the um, New Caledonia we saw from the NS1 production, it gets going very early, it generates RNA much, much quicker than, than California, and it does have a much stronger immune antagonism effect. And so, and so it is using a, a strategy, it, um, it, it doesn't so much, and, and also it's got this nuclear export block once it makes the NS1. So it's as a strategy, it seems willing to let the cat get out of the bag when it's first infected because it's got such a strong response sitting in reserve. So you can respond quickly, but it's going to you know, make a lot of message, but it's going to then suppress protein production, suppress nuclear export, do this very rapidly. And in fact, you get very, very little interferon production that's released from these cells. So you get a lot of message, you get very little interference. So that's its strategic approach to suppressing the name response. California is, is, is leisurely in how it gets going. It doesn't block nuclear export, so it doesn't have that blockade of host response sitting in reserve. And so it has designed a strategy where it's shielding its initial infection. So it has to come in in a, in a, in a stealth mode activate very little initial response. Um, and in fact, it's, it's, with this strategy, it ends up being much, much poorer at suppressing the innate response than the New Caledonia. So the, the, the nuclear export, the rapid kinetics 
is, is a much more effective strategy in actually shutting down the innate immune response than this, even though at the initial gene level, California looks, looks much, much better. Okay, so the other, the other uh, feature we're interested in is, is you know, what differences can we find globally between these pandemics and between these seasonal viruses? Can we get some clue about, from this model, about mechanisms that might relate to their, their pathogenesis? What's striking is, well, this is kind of an unusual principal components plot because it's, um, we're, we're plotting the um, uh, gene response from the time course on PCA axes. We're also including the time domain on this, so the points uh, for each virus are connected, um, and so you can follow the time course through this PCA plot. And so <clears throat> what you see is that, uh, uh, first of all, the, the California is kind of, you know, compared to 1918, it's, it's very, very slow in its evolution, but it, it parallels um, moving along PC1, PC1, 1918, for the entire time course, whereas the Texas and New Caledonia um, hang a left onto PC axis two um, at about four hours, and they go together. So it's, you know, at least the, the appearance of the PCA plot um, uh, was quite striking in that these viruses that infect everybody in the world and the viruses that are seasonal viruses actually have quite a different overall appearance. So we're interested, okay, what, what is underlying that and what could its significance be? <coughs> And, and this just shows we, we did this on two donors, we plotting on the same axes, we get the same results. Um, so, you know, we can analyze for um, uh, what the strain differences are in, in key antiviral pathways. But the, the main uh, issue, and, and we'll get into one of those examples later, but the main issue that's driving this, this um, global pattern is that in the... Uh, uh, seasonal viruses, there's a, there's a global degradation in RNA that's occurring at starting at about four hours. And so we, we studied that, and what we found is that the um, seasonal viruses are, are killing the dendritic cells, and uh, uh, the uh, pandemic viruses are not. Um, and the mechanism, and we've done inhibitor studies, and it's not apoptosis, it's a variant of a necroptosis mechanism. We've looked at various inhibitors and pathways involved. But, um, okay, so what could the significance of this be? And then I can only speculate about this. It's, you know, we can't make pandemics and release them, but what, <clears throat> what might be going on is the, uh, the pandemic, um, it's a new virus, everyone is vulnerable, um, <clears throat> it's um, not going to be selected for developing prolonged immunity that are heterosubtype specific. In other words, in an initial infection, it couldn't care less evolutionarily or in terms of how it's designed, whether when it comes back the next year, you're going to be resistant to it or not. However, if you can efficiently knock off your... Oh, by the way, this is dendritic cell specific. It doesn't kill epithelial cells. So if you can knock off your dendritic cells, what that's going to do is it will interfere, for example, with your generation of, of um, uh, cellular immunity, and cellular immunity underlies cross-virus immunity. So therefore, you might, you might uh, make it uh, easier as the strain comes back in the seasonal year after year, eventually, the seasonal strain may select out an ability to kill off the dendritic cells that leave some of the population more vulnerable, and so it's a very slow selective mechanism potentially for this attribute. So, you know, fortunately the test for this, we have to do a natural experiment, and so what we're doing is, you know, if this, if this is true, we expect that now that California has turned into a seasonal virus, and we are thinking, I mean, that at some point, that California may stumble into this mechanism of killing dendritic cells as the uh, 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 previous seasonal virus strains have. Um, and we'll start killing dendritic cells. So we're collecting the new aliquots uh, as they come by each year. You know, so far through 2011, it doesn't show this property. So I don't know whether this will occur, how long it will take, but we're, we're, you know, we're now we're just getting the, the next year's strain under the test. 
Um, uh, uh, and, you know, it's possible that eventually the California seasonal strain will develop what seems to be a seasonal attribute, but, you know, it's, it's probably not a, a very strong selection pressure. Um, it may give some advantage to the seasonals, but, it, you know, we don't know yet whether or not it will develop. Okay, so, so the other question is what on the virus side is involved in generating this? And uh, again, you know, obviously your first candidate is, I mean, NS1 does everything, so, so you start with NS1. <coughs> and again, NS1 has nothing to do with this. So if we look at the um, death with uh, New Caledonia, um, uh, these assays are done in a Im imaging flow cytometry, by the way. It's a typical assay we use to look at the nuclear morphology. We've also done LDH release. We've done tunnel assays. You get the same results with everything else. But imaging flow ends up being a really nice way to, to uh, uh, assay non-adherent cells for cell death. Um, so um, uh, the California, of course, gives a low rate, similar to the mock. The NS1s and the Texas NS1s have no effect on that. All right, so, so then we <coughs> um, start to explore other recombinants between them to see if something will confer this. Um, and we look at the polymerase uh, uh, chimera virus, where, where the New Caledonia polymerases are introduced. And then we look at the HA and NA uh, recombinants. <coughs> what we find is the polymerase actually has a partial effect on increasing cell death, but the HA and NA alone causes, in the California background, the same level of cell death we've seen with the New Caledonia. So, um, in addition, the, um, the viruses have many other individual response characteristics in the host-virus interaction that we can uh, uh, mine from the time course data set. For example, if we look at NF-kappa B activation, the New Caledonia of all the four viruses is the strongest um, uh, at activating um, NF-kappa B um, uh, responsive genes. And if we then look at uh, imaging flow, comparing the California, the New Caledonia, and the Texas, and we look at single cell translocation of NF-kappa B, um, we get a much higher level of activation of NF-kappa B in, in the New Caledonia compared to the, the other two viruses. So to summarize the strain differences, the H1N1s induce different amounts of interferon and DC cell death. Um, uh, the uh, high interferon induction and DC cell death by the NC strain um, maps, the interferon induction maps to the viral polymerase and probably involves IMPs. The cell death maps to the, um, uh, uh, the sum effect of viral polymerase because it seems to be mostly carried by the HA and NA. Um, the uh, RNPs themselves for New Caledonia activate IF3 activation, and, and for NC we get a very high activation of NF kappa B. Okay, next I'm going to turn to a, another aspect of the story, which is the single cell DC responses. And, you know, um, you know, often we tend to ignore single cell response variation because it's just very hard to study. Um, although it's, it's getting better and better. Um, you know, in, in influenza infection, response variation is, is very, very important in, in dictating the early response and generating the course of the infection. For example, the epithelial cells, you infect a few epithelial cells, you get a race between the innate immune response that causes a heterogeneous local cytokine environment and the viral reproduction. And it's a, it's a stochastic process depending on will you escape that and generate high viral titers just from that initial level of, of uh, uh, immune response and generate a uh, uh, productive infection or will you suppress it and have what's uh, extremely common, a subclinical infection that you just have a local infection that's controlled by the first bearing the innate immune response. Um, Similarly, in the, in the dendritic cell responses, the you know, early responses and their differentiation is, is ultimately going to be very important in, in dictating the emergent uh, innate adaptive transition that occurs. Um, and and uh, you know, in addition, uh, you can think of, you know, in, on the 
I mean, you know, as multicellular organisms, we've learned our own tricks, but we haven't forgotten the ones that occurred when we were single cell organisms. And it's quite clear in single cell organisms, you know, the major physiological strategy is to generate variant responses among single cells, and that ensures that some of them will adapt and respond appropriately to the environment. Well, in the, in the multicell organism, you know, we tend to break cells into groups of cells because that's how we think about things, we categorize them. You know, in flow cytometry, you know, we take this cloud and draw these gates, ignoring the fact that actually these cells show an incredible gradation. The boundaries of the gates are entirely arbitrary, but we'll characterize a particular cell type as, okay, this is, this is a cell type. You know, the reality is, I mean, it's, it's very messy for us to deal with because we don't really have the conceptual framework to address the complexity of single cell variation on top of the complexity of cell subtype variation. Is, you know, we don't have a good framework for this, but you know, the, um, uh, the biological system doesn't respect you know, our own intellectual limitations. And in fact, it distributes what it's doing within single cells and across cell types. And, and you know, to some extent, um, our breaking things into cell subtypes and the response of particular cell subtypes is a, is, a, is a figment of our imagination. I mean, there's this gradation going on at the single cell level. <clears throat> so, for example, if, if we look at the lung um, uh, dendritic cell, you know, in the, you know, we're focusing on humans, and so in the human, there are, there are now two dendritic cells sometimes are identified, the CD1C, that recent work from, from Klaverner and Mary Moran suggests is involved in, in uh, predominantly in driving um, uh, cell-mediated immunity, and the CD141 conventional DC, which is predominantly inv involved in driving humoral immunity, um, and then there's the CD303 plasma cytoid dendritic cell that is, um, generates a significant uh, percentage of the interferon generated during, during early infection and probably mediates, uh, contributes to the course of the disease. If you look at cytokine response profiles in people who um, die of influenza or have worse symptoms, there are a number of studies showing that the you know, dysregulation of, of cytokine patterns are associated with with poor outcomes and, and at very early stages, the PDCs, you know, are likely to play an important role in, in sculpting that that uh, uh, evolution of the response to the disease. However, within these subtypes, you can generate a functional heterogeneity. Um, you know, as an example of that, Aviv Regev's group has a recent uh, paper in which they, they looked at mouse bone matter or derived DCs. Um, treated more heterogeneous, heterogeneously. They were exposed to the LPS, uh, uh, which is a toll-like receptor uh, agonist, and then they did single cell sequencing. And, and they talk about the gene bi bimodality, and actually the, the paper is, is 18 cells of sequence. But if you, if you actually look at the sequences and you look at the data in the paper, um, essentially every cell is showing a, a very unique response. I mean, this genes that are very highly turned on or not turned on in each cell. And, and there's, you know, in, in the data, there's um, sort of, you know, 16 patterns among the 18 cells that, they, that, that she's shown. So, so there's an enormous within cell type heterogeneity of response that, you know, we have to begin to confront. Um, so we're looking at a, a very restricted aspect of this in these experiments. Where we're just looking at the interferon beta response, and, and for these we rely on single molecule counting using fluorescent incentive hybridization. You generate 48 probes against interferon. Um, you can then uh, make a, uh, this is a compressed Z-stack, but if you paste through the Z-stack of the images, um, you can actually resolve each molecule as a point source. It's very, very reliable. I mean, we see zero viral RNAs in uninfected cells, and you never see one. Um, and we've compared it to uh, lots of controls, so we're, we're getting, we think, an extremely accurate count of the actual, you know, there's no amplification of the number of molecules that are generated in each cell. 
So, so it's a lot of work, but it gives you very, very high quality data. So the first thing you notice that, that has been reported in, in other cell systems is that the, the viral RNA and the interferon RNA are, are completely uncorrelated. These, these, are, these are cells infected with the Newcastle disease virus to sort of generate an unopposed response. Um, <coughs> So if we, if we look at the response, uh, how it evolves over time, it's shown in a color with all of, all of the individual data points, virus level, interferon level. Uh, we measure approximately 150 cells uh, at each time point. Um, if you look at the percent infected cells with Newcastle disease, you see it, it comes up early in terms of the number of responding cells, and then there's a late increase in the number of cells that are expressing above background. With, with that infection, you can get a, up to about 10 molecules of interferon from background transcription in occasional cells. It's fairly rare, but, but that's the limit. Um, and you can see you have a few cells that are showing a signal here. But these are, these are the total number of cells showing interferon above zero and, and molecules. And um, it shows the sort of two-phase response. Um, and the average response per cell also shows a similar evolution. If we expose to lipopolysaccharide, we get a different pattern with it. It comes up early, but then it's fairly stable. If anything, it starts dropping at later time points, and the level per cell also drops at later time points, also by single cell, single molecule analysis. So, so we used a, a, a simple model to just sort of extract the features of this response and, and characterize what's involved, where we model it in terms of um, uh, uh, some of the cells are infected or not, some of the cells respond to infection and some of them don't, the cells can vary in their strength of infection, and the cells can vary in the time dispersion after infection in which they generate their response, they either generate it, um, they're forced to generate in a synchronized pattern or they're allowed to generate in a dispersed pattern. And then we um, uh, uh, simulate and, and uh, optimize the fit and generate a cost function to decide which of these models best fit the, the data. <clears throat> so what we see is that for the um, NDV infection, uh, you, you get a uh, uh, fitting of the data best if we include all of the features, including temporal dispersion. Um, uh, in, in, the, in the model, the cost function is lowest, and we've tested this at different multiplicities of infection. Whereas with LPS exposure, different concentrations, um, uh, it, it, it gives the lowest cost if it's forced to have a synchronized induction, um, uh, uh, which you know, conforms with what you might expect from looking at the, the patterns of the cell activation. So, so this leads to sort of our working hypothesis that only a few cells are competent to generate an immediate interferon beta induction to virus. Uh, extracellular signaling from the infected cells must um, enable cells that are not infected later to be able to generate interferon induction. And, and, and so we tested that by blocking cell secretion with Berfeldin and see if it changes the pattern of induction. And, and it does. We see here um, two experiments uh, without Perfeldin. Uh, the expressing cells go up over time. If we add Perfeldin, it's now stable over time. Um, and if we do the cost function analysis um, without Perfeldin, of course, the temporal dispersion is preferred. With Perfeldin, um, we now get uh, synchronized activation of the cells are now preferred. So this this cell-to-cell extracellular signal. We did, we did a, a lot of experiments, and I can take you through, of controls in terms of showing that the um, uh, cells are actually all infected at approximately the same time point, um, uh, uh, things like that. Um, but the um, uh, pattern of response is shaped by, by the um, infection and, and the cytokine uh, uh, effect on, on other cells. Um, and, in, and in fact, we, we've uh, done modeling, which we've published recently, um, where we've looked at the fact that the heterogeneity of the cytokine secretion is likely to be very important because the 
the uh, cytokine initiates it at the initially infected cells, and it, over the course of the infection, it does not uh, evenly mix. It, in fact, generates a local gradient that contributes to the pattern of response that we see. <coughs> so, um, now, <coughs> in, th in this case, we think NS1 is, is probably having a, a big effect on, on the interferon response um, and, and, and on the subsequent um, ability of generating interferon. If we, if we now infect with the NC99 virus, we see that we get this, this um, more of an LPS or Grafeldin-like pattern. Um, now, <coughs> we know that um, there is interferon getting secreted, and the other cells will show interferon response genes, but um, in, the, uh, uh, in the infected cells, uh, what we think is going on is the, is the viral antagonist will then oppose the synthesis of host protein and, and um, host gene uh, and block the export, and so we will um, not generate uh, uh, in, in the increase in the number of cells expressing interferon beta by, this, by these later mechanisms of, of Newcastle disease virus, um, and so it gives us a pattern that's that's much more stable over time. So, so this sort of leads to you know our extended and working interpretation at this point that um, you know first of all only some cells respond to initial infection and we're very interested in why that is. They presumably are expressing something, a key transcription factor, a key component of viral sensing that makes them competent to generate infection. Um, uh, uh, whatever it is, is probably synthesized to response to interferon or cytokine signaling. Um, immune antagonism in NC99 is blocking the synthesis in the cells that can't respond to the RNP complexes immediately and, and blocks the, therefore, the interferon um, production in cells that don't generate a very, very early interferon in messenger RNA. Um, and so now we're interested, okay, what's the difference between ex Infected cells that express interferon and, and don't. So there are sort of three possible explanations. Okay, we could be looking at previously unrecognized cell heterogeneity, um, <coughs> that these are really, even though they're sort of repelled, homogeneously developed cells, they may be, in fact, distinct cell types that we don't recognize. Um, more likely, they are transiently distinct cell types due to all alterations between cells, you know, the, all, all cellular components are going to show a distribution and expression uh, that, that may not be stable within a given cell, but at a particular point in time, the cells may not be distinct subtypes, but they may be functionally distinct. They're in a different response state than the others. And, and of course, there also can be, because the cell has very, very small numbers of many of the key reactants, I mean, it's only got two copies of the interferon beta gene, um, and and we, we did a study a number of years ago looking at the formation of the interferon beta enhancesome and was uh, doing single cell, single allele assays so we can measure how much interference can be made as a control off of each gene copy within, this, within each cell. Um, and so clearly there are also stochastic mechanisms at play uh, just by randomness in determining whether a cell manages to get interferon generated or not. But in any event, we're, in order to explore this, we're interested in um, running um, uh, single cell RNA sequencing on infected dendritic cells to test, uh, do, you know, can we detect a di distinct cell types or from the pattern of gene expression, can we detect functional differences in certain key components? For example, as we saw at a population level, looking at um, NF-kept B differences, we may see functional differences the pattern of gene responses within expressing cells and non-expressing cells that give us a clue about, you know, alterations in phosphorylation state, for example, of certain key components in the cell that we can then test with follow-up studies. So, <clears throat> so I want to thank um, all of the uh, uh, people involved in these studies. I'm not going to go through everything, but. Fernand Hayo, who was involved in the modeling, Sonali Patel, and Miguel Freeberg, who were involved in the single cell analysis and developing the data analysis techniques for that. Boris Hartman, who did uh, the majority of the immune experiments on the um, uh, different H1N1 subtypes. 
um, Adolfo Garcia Sestra's lab, who generated all the viral constructs and predominantly done by Randy Albrecht in his laboratory. Jay Jack Prakash in Ohio State, who also has been involved in all the modeling studies. Steve Kleinstein and Elena Zablowski are uh, computer scientists who uh, we've worked very closely with in developing analysis techniques and, and analyzing the data. So uh, this is the view from our lab. Even though we're in the middle of Manhattan, we actually get to see a nice reservoir and the green of Central Park. And, and the laboratory is on the far side of this building as the PRS for. So thank you very much for listening. So, <clears throat> fascinating stuff. Uh, throughout, you know, you're comparing, uh, comparing the uh, NC and the calipers. Were there lessons then that clearly came out relevant to the 1918 then? So for instance, the NF-kappa B sort of not and so forth. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 we, we extend, I mean, we included the 1918 in most of the studies. And so the, the 1918 and the CAL um, don't kill dendritic cells. The, um, uh, 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 so at least the pandemic characteristic is, is common to both of them, both in the gene evolution study and in the, uh, um, we did cell death studies in the 1918 as well. The mechanisms um, preventing it might be different. From what I said. Um, it's possible. Um, I mean, we could, you know, we can move the, the, um, uh, yeah, it, it would be possible the mechanisms are different. I mean, I think the, um, I don't think it's the mechanism underlying the enormous mortality of the, of the 1918. I mean, it's the difference we see between the 1918 and the uh, California and actually any of the viruses, the, the, in terms of just the time course of evolution of the response, generating viral RNA and generating host response, the 1918 is the fastest. The two pandemics are intermediate and the, um, uh, I mean the two uh, seasonal viruses are intermediate and the, the California, which was a pandemic but was fairly mild in terms of its symptomatology um, and death rate, I mean, you know, it killed 300,000 people. It wasn't, it wasn't benign, and, and it had a predilection for, for young people and old people, like 1918, but, but especially young people, which is unusual. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, it's it's the slowest, and and so presumably the uh, dynamics of the response has has something to do with that, and, and also the 1918 NS1 is is you know the viral suppression mechanisms were very very effective in the 1918. So, um, but, you know, those, um, uh, you know, we can't, I mean, we can, I think what came out of this is, um, I think we have a suggestion about commonalities of pandemic viruses in terms of the clinical effects. Um, I mean, certainly we can see, we can see big differences. It's very hard to know, you know, which features are, are going to be responsible for that from just comparative analysis. Um, well, I mean, we're, we're not measuring, and I'm just referring to to the literature on that. But the, um, you know, the um, uh, you can <coughs> um, uh, you can measure uh, uh, T cell uh, activation to the influenza epitope and the heterotypic element of that, and that that's been done. Um, uh, you know, what's what's found, there are two things that are found. It, it, um, you know, resistance for, um, to influenza inf infection in a subsequent year seems to correlate best with a heterosubtypic immunity that's cellular against that strain, and that's looking looking at T cell T cell responses um, uh, to that virus. Um, in addition, the antibody generation has been optimized. Uh, the vaccine generation has been optimized for. Uh, uh, humoral immunity. So uh, there's a very interesting study where they looked at the <coughs> relationship of the humoral 
looking at the same vaccine, same year, different preparations, different manufacturers, um, and they compare the level of humoral immunity, which is identical for the three vaccines that were tested, and they look at the level of cellular immunity, and they're wildly divergent, because they, you know, the vaccines themselves have not been, um, uh, really, it's only recently they stopped measuring the ability to generate cell immunity, but the vaccines have, have not been optimized for that. And you know, maybe that you know, now that there are identified DC subsets, you know, the issue may be, you know, there are differences. I mean, we've we've looked at some work of of um, uh, looking at the uh, individual DC subsets that are first encountered by the virus in the lung. These, you know, especially these two CDC subsets, the the 141s and, and the 1Cs, and there's a big difference in the infectivity of these for the, for the different viruses and for within the same virus which sometimes gets infected. And so it may be that, that for mucosal vaccines, you know, if you want to develop more heterosubtypic cellular immunity, you need to optimize your virus to target the cell subtype that's mediating that, and that's you know, not been looked at previously. I mean, you know, it's only recently that we know there are multiple uh, CDC subtypes in the lung. Thanks, George.